realagriculture.com presents Farming Forward. Sharpen your soil health expertise with cover cropping, nitrogen management, and advanced grazing. Brought to you by the Farm Resilience Mentorship Program. Hi, I'm Steve Kenyon. I'm from uh, Greener Pastures Ranching. Uh, I run a custom grazing operation near Busby, Alberta. And uh, basically we run other people's cattle on other people's land. We lease all of our land as well. So. Very, very passionate about grazing, obviously. Yes. And um, in terms of, uh, and the idea of carbon sequestration. So talk about what you're doing here. Okay, so yeah, that's what we, we try and do. We do an advanced grazing system here. Um, we rotate cattle around. Um, I use the cattle as a tool to manage the forage. And that's kind of a, a mindset shift that a lot of people don't have, um, or that maybe a lot of people need to get past. Um, the cattle aren't here to manage the cattle, right? I'm using them as a tool to, to manage the grass, which in there helps me grow soil. So carbon is a really big deal right now. Society is all about carbon, right? We've got carbon tax, we've got carbon credits, we've got carbon this and that. Um, and our society right now is trying to get to carbon neutral. And I'm a little bit frustrated because they only look at one side of the equation. Okay, to be carbon neutral, you need to sequester as much carbon to offset what we emit. Okay, to be carbon neutral, that it's a math equation. It's very simple. Um, but the whole world right now is looking at reducing emissions. Okay, they're only looking at one side of the equation, right? We have the ability in agriculture to sequester carbon, right? There's very few industries on the planet that have that ability. Okay, uh, an airline company that's bragging about being carbon neutral by 2030 or 2050 or whenever they are, right? They're never going to get there. They have no way of sequestering carbon, right? All they can do is reduce their emissions, which that's great. They're doing that. Um, even in, in, in agriculture, we're trying to measure how we can reduce emissions, right? In, in single points, and then we can brag about it, and then we can advertise it, and then we can market it, okay? Um, I'm not into marketing, right? I want to actually become carbon neutral or go beyond. We had a study here that on our ranch here, we were way beyond carbon neutral. I think we were 94% sequestration and 6% emissions, right? I mean, we're, we're way beyond carbon neutral. So what we're doing with this is using the plants to sequester carbon. It's not that complicated of a system. Uh, photosynthesis, right? The plants take sun, sunlight energy, pull carbon out of the air to build the plant for the plant to grow. In that, it translocates that carbon down into the root systems, and then the roots push out carbon, uh, in the form of glucose, out into the soil. And the idea of that is to actually feed the soil biology. Right? So that's a, a very powerful tool. It's called exudate, or exudation. And we're pushing that out, and we're adding carbon to whatever the base is. So the, you know, for years, academia has told us, and that's what they taught me when I went to college, that it takes 100 years to grow an inch of topsoil. Okay. What they're thinking of, or their, their frame of mind in that, is leaving residue on top, that residue decomposing and breaking down, and forming thatch layer, and forming soil on top of the ground. That's very slow because most of that carbon volatizes off back into the air, right? Most of it cycles above ground. If we look at using exudation as our way of growing soil, we're pushing that root down into the ground and pushing carbon out into the base, we can grow soil a lot faster. As an example here, um, a few years ago, the University of Alberta came out and did a study in our, our place. And we had, long story short, we ended up taking, in 15 years, we took, as compared to the field beside it, was at 5.2% soil organic carbon. Uh, we took ours up to 11%, right, in 15 years. And in that time, we also grew 10.8 inches of topsoil, right? We've got the, the, the soil data to show that. So that's a lot faster than 100 years, right? And we're growing that. Uh, because then, you know, the, the comparison field beside it had basically no topsoil. It was the same color all the way down. Okay, so we can do that. Uh, this field here we've had for about 20 years, and we're gonna show you the soil profile and how we've built that up. Because um, we don't start with any topsoil. This is a gray wooded soil. Um, basically, this used to be all trees. And uh, when you wipe out the trees, you basically start with no topsoil. So even when we, we took this over, it was a pasture, but there was hardly anything growing. It was severely overgrazed and, and virtually no topsoil here. There was just some grass growing. 
So over the last 20 years, we've grown a lot of topsoil. We've got on average probably somewhere between eight and 12 inches of topsoil on here now. And it's, it's not that we're growing above ground. What we're doing is converting the base. So we've got a very clay base. So we've been adding carbon into that clay for 20 years. And now we've got, you know, eight to 12 inches of black topsoil. And down the road, about 10, 15 miles is where the black soil zone starts. That's where all the grain land is, right? And I've got videos and pictures of land down there that's all brown and gray now because they've depleted all of the top, all that carbon out of the topsoil. So Steve, what, what are you doing that is kind of flipping what academia has been saying? You're, you've, you're flipping it on its, on its head kind of. What, what, like, what does that actually look like in practicality? Yeah, we are focusing on photosynthesis, really. Um, there's a term called albedo. Um, it is the difference between the amount of light that comes down versus what's reflected. Okay, so if the sunlight comes down and hits green growing plant material like you see here, it's being absorbed and we're going to get more carbon, right? We're gonna, we're gonna sequester carbon. If it hits bare soil or, or you know, overgrazed or dirt, right, a cultivated field, it gets reflected back and we never get the carbon that way. So with our advanced grazing system, uh, we focus on five grazing principles. We've got graze period, rest period, animal impact, stock density, and soil armor. Okay, we focus on those principles, especially the graze period, rest period. We can keep these plants in a vegetative state for most of the summer, right? Right from, you know, as soon as it's warm enough in the spring, we're collecting sunlight. Uh, throughout the season, we don't ever let them get mature, right? There's still nice green plants out here that are absorbing, uh, taking in carbon absorbing sunlight. And then even late in the fall, we've still got vegetative plants, right? So a, um, a typical lifespan, if we just let this grow, we'd have some very small plants in the spring, collect a little bit of sunlight, we'd get this vegetative plant, and then it would go to seed. Once it goes to seed, we're no longer collecting very much sunlight because that, that plant is mature and now it's gonna drop the seeds off, it's done. So we wanna keep knocking that plant down. Uh, picture a hay field, right? It grows in the spring, you knock it down, you get a nice second growth. Um, that's what we're trying to do with our pastures. We, we manage those concepts. Now, if you're in a different area, you might manage them a little differently, right? If you're in a really dry area, you might only be able to graze them once. If you're in a you know, medium like us, we're in a, a moderate rainfall area, we might get two rotations, two grazings. In a really wet environment, you might get five, okay? At 50,000 feet, the principles cover a wide geography. It's what you do at 10,000 feet that could be different between geographies. Yes, yeah, for sure. I mean, the concepts remain the same, but you adapt the concepts to your environment. No different than growing wheat in Kansas could be a little bit different than some of the practices you engage if you're growing wheat in say, Manitoba. You bet, you bet. Um, you look at it as, uh, what kind of engine do you have, right? Do you have a, a V8? Well, it does a lot better because it's in a, in a, you know, it's a lot more powerful. If you've got a little, you know, four cylinder, right? It's not going to do as much. You got to manage it a little differently. So, you know, the drier area, that, that water, that's a big part. And I'm in a moderate area, right? We've had two, two years of severe drought. And then this spring was, was very, very dry. Uh, we just got a bunch of rain. So everybody's like cheering right now. Uh, we still have really good grass, even though we've been through two and a half years of drought, uh, because we manage for that water cycle. Leaving residue on top, that's super important for absorbing moisture and holding on to it. So also building that uh, carbon layer, right? Building that, that AH horizon, the deeper it is, the bigger it is, the more water we hold. And that's what powers the engine. If you enjoyed this video and want to continue to sharpen your soil health expertise, encourage you to go to farmlearninghub.ca to learn more.